All right, guys. Uh, you know, you know, when when you take on a project, you guys, this is very important for 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 us to know as men and women of God. When you start trying, when you take on an assignment from the Lord, and 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 sometimes you have to do reverse engineering. You gotta like, I used to do this. Once I, <laughs> I had to get out of my old environment and get back into my own, uh, into the things of God. And then I realized that I reversed engineering why the enemy was trying to assassinate me. And most times I helped him because of bad choices, decisions and all that. But then you start to realize that when you start, start stepping on the enemy's toes, remember I said, Going to church doesn't get you, you know, it doesn't, the devil loves that. He goes to church with many people every day, every Sunday. He just, just he'll sit right next to you. It's not going, to, we need to go to church. You need to belong. You need to do that stuff. But it's when you start becoming the church in your circle of influence, or you start taking on an assignment that the Lord put on your heart. And if Jesus was walking and he does walk the earth with us in the spirit, but if he's going to set up camp, guess where he's going to set it up? I don't think he's going to set it up in church because we go there for military, like a military compound. He's going to set it at the footsteps of the enemy. He's going to go downtown. He's going to go in front of cheetahs. He's going to go in front of little darlings. He's going to set it there because he said, look, upon this rock. And I told you, our Catholic brothers and sisters, they got it all wrong when he said he wasn't talking about Peter. He was standing in a place that still exists today. It's a cave where to this day they believe that it's the gate of hell. It's where demonic spirits come in and out. And he says, I'm going to build my church at the footstep of the compound of the devil himself, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. So doing something in, in a place like downtown, it, it, which I, I was born and raised here, so that's very special to me. So, so, so was Noel and some of us. We, were, we used to be cray-cray too, but the Lord saved us in our own city. He saved us here, so it has a special meaning to us. When something like that happens, and, and some of us can attest to when that stuff starts happening and the warfare hits, and it's not a light thing because the enemy's job is to steal, kill, and destroy. You, your seed, your bloodline, your vision, your hopes, your dreams, your company, everything. He is not, we think he's playing. No, he ain't playing. He ain't playing, just like God ain't playing either. Both sides, you guys remember I tell you, there's two sides of the cross. You guys remember that? You guys remember the story of the two people standing on one, one man on one side of the cross and one man on the other side of the cross, and Jesus is in the middle about to give up his life and say, it is finished. Now, that gives me a picture of humanity itself. One man looks at Jesus and says, and mocks him and says, if you're really this Christ, why don't you get yourself, get me and you down from this place? And, and, and he mocked him and didn't believe that he was the Christ. The other man said, oh, you, why don't you be quiet because we deserve death. Because we're really the criminals. We're criminals. We deserve to be up on this cross. He's innocent. He doesn't deserve to be here. And then he looked at Jesus and said, will you remember me in your kingdom? And Jesus looks, I promise you today you're going to be in paradise with me. Okay, so that's a picture of, that's the that's picture of humanity. Some will reject and mock Jesus, and some will acknowledge that he is the Christ and go into paradise with the Lord. It's giving you a paradigm. You guys understand that? And so, and so it's important that we unify, and we are not known for unification in this city, because I know, because I was born and raised here. And, I, and, and But when you start unifying, all you got to do is mention, well, I want to unify this. You just opened up a door to like, ooh, enemy cup. Why? Why? Because the enemy hates unification because there's power in numbers when a group of people get together and say, hey, we're not about a platform. It's all about Jesus Christ and him crucified and him resurrected. You guys follow me on that? So I'm really heavy on this. We're going to support this. And, 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 and to me, it's prophetic what we're doing, what you guys are doing, because we were going to do it right about Passover. Okay? We're in the Passover month. And I'm telling you, God, 
I'm going to get a little Jewish on you guys because they, they celebrated the feast in the, in the New Testament as well. But we have the real reason to celebrate the feast. So we were going to have it about Passover, and 50 days later is Pentecost, which in Passover they came out of Egypt, but Jesus was crucified on Passover and resurrected. 50 days later, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, came upon them. And then, but what happened in the Old Testament? When Moses went up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, that was Pentecost. Okay? Now we're going to have the Roar Fest at Tabernacles. Woo! Jewish New Year! Okay, well, pay attention. As soon as Passover hits, it's the first harvest. The, the flowers start blooming. The second harvest is tabernacles. A lot of scholars, even a lot of scholars, even the Jewish people believe that Jesus will come back during tabernacles, which is the second harvest. In other words, the second harvest in tabernacles, which is uh, Yom Kippur, uh, Jewish New Year, and so it, 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 it's right before the winter hits and the second bloom comes, yeah. okay? First harvest right here, if Jesus comes back, I, you know, it's good to celebrate him because I would rather be partying because all these festivals, they're designed so you can have a party. I'm going to have a little party. Invite some friends over. Hey, 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 because, you know, it involves eating, having friends over, drinking the 10 glasses of wine and stuff like that. We'll have some grape juice for those of people that don't drink the wine. But they're designed to celebrate God's goodness in your life. See, the Jewish nation, the Orthodox Jews, they're still waiting for the Messiah. He already came. We have the real reason to really celebrate Passover Pentecost and Tabernacles, because we get together, celebrate them, and say, yippee, this is what you've been doing in my life, and then you share, you share stories about how God parted the Red Sea in your life, and you share it with your children, and you, and the Jewish nation has been doing that forever, guys. They've been doing it since Moses' day. They get together. They have a Passover meal. They explain how they got saved in Egypt, delivered, and, and, they, and they, they begin to show their children how God has been the deliverer, their deliverer forever and ever and ever. And they, it trickles down from generation to generation. We could still do that, guys. If you don't celebrate the feast, are you condemned? Absolutely not. Are you missing out? Maybe. I'll explain that today. It, it, it's like p the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, these feasts are like, who likes to celebrate their birthday? Who likes other people to celebrate you on your birthday? <laughs> Christmas. It's like an anniversary date. In the Bible, we call these appointed times. These are appointed times. These are appointed times that God set up for us to celebrate him. Now, why is that important? We're going to learn a little bit today, guys. And I'm going to teach you guys something that I want you guys to keep in your mind at all times. One of the ways that we're going to know who that devil, the Antichrist is, you know what, one, one, one way we're going to know who he is? He's going to try to change the appointed times. So when you hear some fool talking about you can't have Passover no more, you can't have Pentecost, and you can't have Tabernacle. You better pay attention to that person because he could be the Antichrist. By the way, they already tried to do that. You guys remember what got us into the Dark Ages? Who knows what the Dark Ages were? Come on, guys. You guys know that. Who knows who the Dark Ages were? We went into the Dark Ages. You know what started that? They told the Jewish people, you can't celebrate Passover no more. And as a matter of fact, if we catch you celebrating Passover, we're going to kill you. So they made it so the Jews couldn't celebrate Passover no more. That's led us into the Dark Ages. You know what happened in there? Anyone that said they were a Christian, we'll kill you. You're a witch. You're not a Christian. You're a witch. You know what got us out of the Dark Ages? Come on, guys. The 500th anniversary of Martin Luther King. Uh, with 500 years, 2017 was the 500 year anniversary where Martin Luther went to the Catholic Church and he put 95 proclamations on their doorstep. I don't need to confess my sins to you. You're not my God. You're not my father. I can go to him by myself. The, faith shall, uh, the, the just shall live by faith. He put 95 things where their, their doctrine was in error. As soon as that happened, guys, what do you think they wanted to do to him? They weren't going to invite him over for dinner. They wanted to kill him. 
Why? You're a witch. You, 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 they're not going to follow us no more. They're going to go to you. Well, that, that, that immediately when that happened, let me tell you how powerful the word of God is. I'm telling you, it makes you smarter, guys. The minute he did that, all of a sudden, they started printing Bibles for all the normal folk. You guys ever been in a church? All right, here we go. I'm just going to break it down to you guys. You ever been in a church? Orthodox, they still do this stuff, guys. They're all dressed nice and fancy, and they got a barrier, a barrier between them and you. And you aren't involved. You can't get back here. It's, it's a barrier. They still do that today, guys. Well, who broke down the barrier, by the way? Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, the veil was broken because of what Jesus did. That means we all have access into the kingdom. We all have access into the throne room. We all have access into the courts of heaven. Okay, but you, bet you can't just come by yourself, by the way. You have to have Jesus Christ right next to you the mediator of the new covenant. He's your lawyer. Okay, so I want to say that so we can kind of get a picture that we're entering into the Passover in a couple weeks, Passover. Okay, this is a leap year, guys. Every four years, it's a leap year. This is a leap year. You can go, go big or go home. You can tell the Lord, but don't say this unless you really are prepared. You can tell the Lord... Okay, Lord, it's Passover, and uh, I would like to leap into my future. Or I would like you to bring your future closer to me. I would like to engage you on that level. If, you're, if you feel that it, something is happening in your life about delay, and you say, I need you to help my business leap into the future. Where is your future? Mark t teaches this. How to write down your vision. If you ain't got a... a, a all right, I'm going to keep it real. If you ain't got your vision written down, you ain't serious. Yeah. You ever notice when you write stuff down? Oh, I'm serious. I got it written down right here. And I know the date that I read it down. I wrote it down on this. This is the deal I got going with God right here. You start writing stuff down like that and say, Lord, and wave it before the Lord. The Lord loves it when you wave stuff before him. Write something down on a piece of paper. That's up to you. You don't have to engage God on that level, but if you do, you'd be surprised. Okay, now watch this. You can ask God, Passover historically, guys, just like in Pentecost and just like in Tabernacles, historically, miracles happen during that time. What happened on Passover? They came out of Egypt in the Old in the Testament. What happened on Passover? They, all these miracles leading up to the crucifixion was happening. Uh, and then he got crucified, but the real big miracle is he actually rose from the dead. So miracles, I got delivered on Passover. I started engaging God when I knew that he delivered me from drug addiction, all kinds of addictions, in one moment, on one weekend, through a deliverance Jewish messianic ministry, and I was just like, bam! But it was on Passover, and ever since then, I will celebrate Passover just so I can remember that day. OK, so miracles happen on that day and you can go big or go home with the Lord and say, I would like a miracle to happen in my life during Passover. You could do that. If it's a big deal to you, God will make sure it's a big deal. If it's not, no harm, no foul. God will not condemn you. It's not a big deal. OK, now watch this. This is what I want to talk about. I want everybody in this room right now to think about something. And this is what I want you to think about. If you feel that there has been a delay, a delay in the promises that you're believing God for and the purposes of God. Now, there's a difference between the purposes of God in your life and your own personal purposes. You can still co-create with God and say, I would like to include this as my heart's desire for my future, okay? And then, or disruption of the timing of God in your life. Like, anybody been waiting for a prayer to be answered and it's taken like more than 20 years? 15 years, 10 years, 12, something like that, something like that? You know, like, Lord, have you anyone ever said, when, Lord? Like, when? How long am I going to wait? Because it's getting to me. If you've, you know, because there's a, a such thing, guys, as the timing of God in your life. Now, this is the year of the open door, okay? 
a double door. That's what four stands for. Five, seven, eight, four, the year. 2024, 24, the four means double door. Okay, so there's a difference between you trying to walk in a door and you want to force your way in there. And God is saying, well, this isn't the timing for that yet. I was wanting you to grow up a little bit more before I have you go in there. And then, but there's another difference where God opens the door and says, come this way, walk in this way. This door has been prepared for you because you're at the level that I need to advance you forward. So you have to be careful, but you can actually ask the Lord, don't let me be out of timing with you. Let the timing of the Father carry me. Because I don't want to jump the gun because it's his timing, not my timing. God doesn't sit in time, guys. He sits over here and believe it or not, he created time. What did, who did he create time for? For us. You know why the devil hates you and me? Because when the devil messed up, he told the devil, just because you did that, we're going to do a seed war, me and you. My seed against your seed, and my seed will win in the end because I already know the end. But the punishment for you is I'm going to lock you in time. In other words, I'm going to lock you up in jail forever and ever and ever and ever. And for my children, my sent ones, my hidden ones, them, they're going to live forever and ever and ever where you used to live. Yeah. Ah? That's why the devil hates us, guys. He's going to jail. We're being set free on the regular. That's why the devil wants to kill us, by the way. He hates the position we have. He's going to jail. We're going to be set free continually. All right. And then delay the promises, the purposes, disrupt the timing of God and disqualify altogether. Okay. Once saved, always saved. Get away from that kind of teaching, guys. That is, that is not biblical. Uh, you can disqualify yourself from the inheritance, the promised land, the inheritance, and I call that bad word FDUs. We'll talk about FDUs. FDU, man. <laughs> All right, I'm not cussing. It just means fear, doubt, and unbelief. Don't, don't be like Noel over there. All right, all right, all right. I want to do this teaching, so as we approach Passover, and we're going to do on Friday, we're going to do communion, right, on that weekend. We're going to do communion so you can engage God and say, Lord, I, I feel you have to reverse engineer. And what do I mean by that? Every story in the Bible, guys, there's a story where God, when he begins to speak to you and talk to you, he ain't talking about your past. He forgave you of that if you repented, right? He actually sits in a place over there, like way over here in your future self, the way you are in the future with how he created you. In other words, he has a book. We all have a book. With your, when you began your journey and everything you're supposed to do in Christ and out of, you know, in Christ, right? And he has a book that's written. That's where prophecy comes in. We prophecy in part in little bits. So when we speak prophetically over somebody, for those, those of us that do that, you're getting little bits and pieces out of that book and you're putting it in another spirit. The Lord says he put destiny inside of our hearts, right? So God speaks to us in the future, in your future self, and he says, come this way, come this way. He, he did that with Gideon. Gideon was hiding. God wanted to use him. And he was uh, threading graves in a place where you shred wheat. And God says, hey, warrior, what are you doing? What are you doing? Let's go, let's go do some work. And he goes, warrior? I'm a coward. I'm hiding. No, you're not a coward. You're a coward in your mind, but in the, in the spirit, you're a warrior. Now, I need you to come with me and start doing some things. And he was used as a deliverer. Moses was a stutterer, a murderer, a liar. He was all these things. And God says, I'm still going to use you. Well, I can't speak. Well, then I'll send your son with me, with your brother with you so he can speak for you. Excuse after excuse, and God still called him. So he was, in other words, when, when God is asking you, God forbid we have to pray, everybody. God forbid you have to read your word. In other words, God sits in your future and he says, come this way. And then he also says, do the things that you're supposed to be doing in the future. <laughs> like pray. <laughs> he sees you praying in the future and he's asking you to do what you're supposed to do in the future. 
King David was a man who acted like a Christian, but he wasn't a Christian because Christ didn't get crucified yet. He did all this stuff like, I'm so close to God that I feel that he's inside of me. He was not on the inside of David. He was on the outside of David, but he would come on top of David and then he would do stuff. You guys follow me on that? And King David was a man of the future. This is, this is what King David did, guys. He grabbed Christianity and he pulled it into the past and he began to walk. All right, I'll prove it to you. The, the Jewish priest, they would have, you know that breastplate with a bunch of stones? They had two stones. It's called the Uman and the Thurman. And they would, the priests would rub them like this and when they were making a decision on judging a matter. And by them doing that, God would give them wisdom. Yeah, this person's lying. This one's telling the truth. Go with that one. And so when, when King David was going to make a decision when his clan, his tribe got destroyed or kidnapped, and he said, oh, man, my, my, my 600 warriors are about to stone me. I better do something quickly. And he says, bring me the, turban, bring me the, the, the tunic. And it was a priestly tunic. Okay, by the way, he's from the tribe of Judah. You can't be touching no priestly tunic. You can't even touch it because, number one, you're not a Levite. You're not a priest, okay? But he says, bring it to me. Who's going to argue with the king, right? And he puts it on, and he, he goes, and he rubs the umen and the thurman, and he says, should I go get my stuff back? And God is looking at him, number one, I should kill you for wearing the tunic because only the Levites are supposed to wear the tunic. But God wrote the Bible before the Bible came into our existence. The Bible wasn't even written then. And God says, but I know in Revelation, I have it written down that Jesus is going to create a kingdom of priests, priestesses, kings, and queens, and you shall be a royal priesthood. He was acting like a royal priesthood, even though he was king already. King is about taking territory. Priesthood is about stewarding the blood of Jesus in the marketplace. Follow me? That was King David acting like a priest, and he wasn't a priest. And you know what God said? If you want to act like a Christian in the future, so be it. Go get your stuff back. And he did. All right. Now, I said all that. So you guys can understand, we are part of the royal priesthood. We are kings and queens and priests, and we're supposed to steward the blood of Jesus properly. So in your mind, as we enter Passover, I want you to think about if you feel that there's been a delay, if you feel that the timing of God has been interrupted, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a little bit on that, and, then, and, if you, and, and, and we are not part of the disqualify, disqualifying crew, okay? Why are we not part of the disqualifying crew? I'll tell you why. Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. All right. You guys, you, you, you guys see what's being said there? We are not of those that draw back. Most of us don't even realize that the biggest miracle that God did in your life, he already did it. He saved you. We were going to burn in hell forever and ever and ever. And he yanked you out. All the rest is nothing. It's like nothing. All right, now watch this. Watch this. I want you to pay attention to those things. Why? Because come Passover, if you want to entertain God on that level, I need you to go for it and be bold and do it. Now watch this. Let me see how much time I got. I think I got the time. All right. You guys remember the story of uh, Moses coming out. Who saw the Ten Commandments? Come on, guys. For those of you that don't read the Bible and you want to watch Ten Commandments, my favorite movie, Charlton Heston. You can't, you can't mess with Charlton Heston, okay? <laughs> and he's part of the NRA when he was alive, by the way. Okay, remember they got him out of Egypt? Okay, now pay attention to this, guys. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And I'm going to show you stories in the Bible. There's so many where the timing of God was messed up and they paid a price for it. Or when the delay of the promise and the purposes. Now, see, there's two kingdoms at work. The devil uses his people, and God uses us. It always will be that way. So all those hater aids that are drinking hater aid and hell like you, good. Bless them. You're blessed. 
and move on. Because God uses his people, the devil uses his people. Nothing happens on the face of the earth unless those people, uh, 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 there's only two parties at play here. Game of Thrones, guys, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Okay, now watch this. God told Abraham, God told Abraham 400 years before they would go into slavery. Okay, he told them what was going to happen. And I, 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 if, some, if God tells you, by the way, uh, your family, you know, the ones that are coming after you are going to be enslaved and they're going to suffer and they're going to cry. I don't know about that day. It would hurt. It would hurt. But what, 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 watch. If you go to Acts, Acts 7.22. No, make, make it Exodus, Exodus 2.11. Exodus 2.11. Now, it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. Watch this. Watch this. Moses was 40 years old. He was the prince in Egypt. You guys know the story? He was the prince of Egypt, but he discovered, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm a Hebrew, but I'm in the Pharaoh's kingdom, you know, and, and, and he goes like this. And he says, and he looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brothers. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Can you imagine that, guys? He was 40 years old. And he saw one of his brethren, one of the Hebrews, beaten on another Hebrew, uh, one of the uh, guards of the Egyptians. And he goes over there and he kills the Egyptian and then he buries them in the sand. OK, now, if you go to Acts chapter seven, verse 22, uh, Acts chapter seven, verse 22. Watch what happens. This is New Testament, guys. Don't be deceived here. And Moses, watch this. This is in Acts, guys. And Moses was educated in the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and in deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the, his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he de defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. OK, and suppose he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And the and the following day appeared to them. They were fighting together and he tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But one of them was injured. The one that was injuring his neighbor pushed him away and said, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You did not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday. And, and that made when when that when his own people rebuked him guess what moses did he left he went to the land of medium median and he became a shepherd i will bet you that moses used a staff to beat the egyptian you're going to see how what happens in the future of moses he used a staff to murder a man and then he buries him in the sand and then he goes into exile. Now, in another scripture, I'm saying this for a reason. In another scripture, it says that after 40 years, watch this. I'm going to read it right now. Exodus 12, 41. Watch this. God tells Abraham, your people are only going to be enslaved for 400 years. Exodus 12, 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years. See, you got to catch the details here. 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from Egypt. You guys see that? How did it go from 400 years that God said, but it was actually 430 years? 30 years in that day, you know what that was? A whole generation. You didn't live that long over there. You were getting killed all the time. So whose fault was it that it took an extra 30 years? Who's got 30 years to spend? I don't. I used to think when I was 20, I had 30 years. And then you turn 50 and you're like, what the heck? Am I a senior citizen now? <laughs> oh, where did the 30 years go? So it took 30 years longer for them to come out of Egypt. Whose fault do you think that was? It could have been Moses' fault. Why? God was going to use them while he's sitting in the palace, but instead... I think God wants me to go kill that Egyptian under my own power. 
and he struck the Egyptian. And God says, well, I wasn't planning on you doing the work. I was going to do the work, my, by the way. I was going to do 10 plagues and all this. But since you did that, now you're going to delay the whole program that I have for my people for an extra 30 years. And he sent him into, he went into exile. And guess what he learned how to do in 40 years, guys? What was he? Anyone know what Moses' job was in those 40 years? Who said that? Someone's reading, uh, someone give him a biscuit because he's <laughs> reading the Bible. You guys, he took him out. Well, he ran, but he learned how to shepherd sheep. And you don't beat on your sheep. You guide them. You do this. They listen to your voice. And God took him through the school of shepherding. And guess what God did after 40 years? I'm sending you back to where you messed up. In other words, listen to this, guys. We do not fail tests. You are not a failure. You didn't fail the test. God's just going to have you take the test again. Yeah. Ah, ah, here we go, Cheryl. Watch this, watch this. Watch. Noel, Noel. Oh, you know, some of us that grew up here, we were 17 years old. Club in, yeah. Noel used to have these disco shirts that were like here. Oh, man. It was like, yeah, we're clubbing. And God takes us out of that lifestyle, and then he says, I'm sending you back. Now you're not going to be a disco king. You're going to do roar fest on the footsteps of Satan's gambling hall. Whoa! And now you've got to represent the kingdom in hell. You see how God is? I know that it was because of Moses messing up that it delayed 30 years of God's plan, but God is so still so good. And he sent them back. Guess what he had in his hand when he sent them back? Yeah. That. What was the first miracle that he made them do to look at Pharaoh? Made that staff turn into a snake. That's how I know that he probably used a staff to kill the Egyptian because God said, by the way, you don't need. It's my power, not your power. Every time God's going to do something big in your life, expect God's power, not your power. But when you want to take matters into your own hand, don't be blaming God if things ain't working out for you. You guys follow me on that? Now, why am I saying this, guys? Because there's a difference between you working on your power and there's a difference between waiting for God's power. We are the people that we wait for God's power and the timing of God. All right. I said all that. Now, watch this. Watch this, because we're going to ask God this Passover to the spirit. There's actually a spirit of delay that tries to stop the plans of God in your life. OK, Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak. Watch this. This is the Antichrist. Daniel, he shall speak pompous words against the most high, persecute the saints. He's talking about the, 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 the end times, the persecute the saints of the most high, and he shall attend to change times and law. The Antichrist will try to change times and law. Times. He tries to interfere with the timing of God. Why? Because the devil is not a creator. God is the creator. God made time to favor you. So he's going to try to get you, tempt you to bring molly, smolly, ugly, butter face to get you to turn the other way. And you ain't following the Lord no more because he put something in front of you and you grab it and you want to blame God for that. No, absolutely not. That's what the devil does to us, guys. But you'll know him because he's going to try to change the time. What if God made it for this year for you to open it going through your double door this year, but all hell breaks loose in your life and you succumb? We are not of those that succumb, guys, right here. All right, Ephesians 5, 5, chapter, uh, verse 7, 5 and 15 and 17. Watch this. See that you work circumspectly. Circumspectly means exactness. See that you walk, uh, see that you walk exactness, with exactness, not as fools. By the way, this is New Testament. They were calling people fools all the time over here. Not as fools, but as wise. Watch this. 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You guys, redeeming the time means this. Buy up the moment. Buy up the moment. Sometimes when you hear a word, who's ever been to church? And you sit there, you go, man, he just called out my dirt. He was speaking right to me. I'm still hungover from the club with Noel. 
Right, right, right. And then he's, he's hitting you with that. And then you walk out and you go right back to where you were. No, 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 no. You didn't redeem the time. The time was that moment that he spoke to you and the minister speaking and you, he wants you to redeem the time. Be, all right, here we go. Uh, ugly girl. What's her name? Uh, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Billy Graham. A week before she died, Billy Graham goes up to her. Hey, 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 hey. What you need is Jesus in your life. She looked at him and said, I don't need your Jesus. I got everything that I need. She was dead within a week. She didn't redeem the time of the man of God speaking directly to her. Only God knows when you're going to leave. He knows the beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher. He's the alpha and the omega. He knows your story. All right, now watch this. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians 2.18. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Watch this. Paul, the apostle, is telling us that the devil be jacking up things. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, Time and time again, but Satan hindered us. Okay, if the devil is going to hinder Paul, the apostle who wrote three quarters of the New Testament, you don't think he's going to try to work on you? You better believe he's working on you. Trying to, that is. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 and 10. Nor let us, watch this. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Oh, Lord. That's New Testament, by the way. What? God destroys things by serpents? I don't know. That's what the Bible says, guys. Uh, nor com Watch this. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. You mean to tell me there is a destroyer that is activated when you start complaining? I didn't say that, guys. The Bible says that. You can read that in the New Te Old Testament, too. You could read that when they came out of Egypt and they murmured and complained. And you could see what happened to them. I don't know. You guys don't have to believe that if you don't want to. It's advisable, though. Genesis 15, 13. Then he said to Abraham, watch this. God is talking to Abraham. All right, here we go, here we go. God does nothing on planet Earth unless he reveals it to a man or a woman, his prophets. So God told Moses what was going to happen. God told Abraham what was going to happen. God told Noah what was going to happen. He just keeps telling people what's going to happen. The question is, is do we believe what's going to happen? <laughs> then he said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land. That is not theirs and serve them and they will afflict them for 400 years. There is the scripture that says, I'm going to lock you guys. I'm, you guys are going to be slaves for 400 years. It took 430 years and it's probably because of Moses. Okay, here we go. Uh, Proverbs 10, 27. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. This is the clue, guys. The fear of the Lord prolongs the days. Who wants their days prolonged? I know I do. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. That's two people. Okay? Contrasted. One has fear, one doesn't. The wicked, they get shortened. Proverbs 9, 11. For by me, watch this, watch this. Me meaning Christ. For by me, your days will be multiplied and your years of life will be added to you. Uh, and Joel 2.25, watch this, watch this. This is how I'm going to close with this scripture right here. Joel 2.25, watch this. I will restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You know what I don't like about this? Which I would say, whoa, 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 back up, God. You sent them? You sent those locusts? Swarming, crawling, consuming, chewing little monsters that chew away at you? Oh, Lord. God sent them? I don't know. Own your own planet and do what you want, but that's the way he does it. God is God. I'm not going to argue with him. You know why? I read the book of Job. Job argued with him. He set him straight, but he restored him, though. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go, guys. All right, now, I, I said all that, guys, so I can actually get into, uh, to, uh, I actually can uh, get into our teaching, and it's going to be quick, guys. You already know because you are a man or woman of God and you got salvation and the kingdom of God stepped into you and you invited, he didn't, you didn't find him, he found you. 
The Bible says he knew you before you mommy and daddy got together. He predestined you. And if he predestined you, he knows that you would be struggling when you're struggling. But he also knows you'd be coming up when you're coming up. In other words, he's standing in your future and he says, I knew you would be in this position. So just keep your eyes on the future with me. What we do is that's why he says, don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right. Keep your eyes on the mark. Who's the mark? Jesus is the mark. Okay, now watch this. The enemy's tactic is, all right, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. 400 years. And then I'm going to send a deliverer. By the way, it's going to be the one, the same one that messed you guys up for an extra 30 years. It was Moses. <coughs> Let me tell you what I think happened. And I'm going to tell you why. I think Moses had a problem with anger. This is why you have to deal with those things that we have. I know Mark, I love Mark's testimony on how he used to be. You guys ever see Tasmanian Devil? Yeah! That was Mark at his job and his company. Yeah! And then he didn't know he was that until he asked his employees, what do you guys see about me? Well, you're like a little Tasmanian little guy. <laughs> right? Yeah. But he would have never known if someone didn't tell him until he asked his wife, honey, uh, what do you see that I don't see? Well, you got a, uh, I got about a book this thick, honey. Okay, now watch this. Moses had a problem with anger, and I think it showed up when he killed the Egyptian. I'm thinking he used the staff. Now watch this. When they were coming out of Egypt, and they were free, and they're in the desert, one time God said, okay, they're, they're about to kill me, so I, I, and they're thirsty. And God said, oh, he was irritated with them. Moses was irritated. And God says, I need you to go strike the rock. And he struck the rock, and the rock Water came out, and they all had something to drink, right? Okay. In the Bible, in the New Testament, it says that Jesus is the li living waters will flow from the belly. But Jesus is like, uh, he told the, the, the Samaritan woman, he who takes a drink from my well will never ever thirst again. So it kind of tells you that Jesus is the rock of our salvation, that he has water for us. Whoo, whoo. The second time they complained in the, in the desert, in the wilderness. That's why I say, guys, if you're in a wilderness with the Lord and you feel like I'm really being challenged and I feel like I ain't got no, there ain't no oasis going on. It's all challenge, challenge, challenge. Whatever you do, learn from other people's mistakes. Do not murmur and do not complain. That's why I'm going to tell you that, because what you do is look for the water. <laughs> in Jesus. Look for the oasis, which is in Jesus. Okay, but do not murmur and complain because you might be subject to swarming, crawling, consuming, chewing locusts. Okay? Now, this time he told Moses, I need you to go speak to the rock. And so to me, God was saying, dude, you've been using that staff too long. I'm about to upgrade you where from now on, you don't need to raise your staff. All you got to do is speak a word, and I'm going to establish it. So he said, go speak to the rock. This is how God treats leaders, by the way, guys. He went to go, and because he was so mad that the people were murmuring and complaining, ah, and he goes, you guys, and he went like this, who am I? And then he, boom, and he hit the rock. He got angry. He probably hit him, hit the rock in the same way that he hit the Egyptian. So out flares his iniquitous pattern of anger. He struck the rock and God said, I told you to speak to it and you hit it. But because Moses did that in the presence of the people, he goes, you dishonored me. You disrespected me. I'm your leader and you're supposed to be my leader, and you hit the rock? And God said, probably God said, you hit my son. You hit Jesus. Because in the future, he will be the rock of people's salvations. And you hit him? No, 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 no. That's reserved for, the, for other people to hit him, but not my leader. You see what I mean? 
That cost him not going into the promised land. So don't tell me you can't disqualify your inheritance. Moses did not see the promised land. No, he did see the promised land from a distance, but he couldn't walk into the promised land. So you can get away from me from that gospel of oh, once saved, always saved. Yeah, he was saved, but he didn't get the inheritance that God had for him. Yeah. Got it? Okay, why? Because that's the way God deals with his leaders. He dishonored God. But I also think that he had an iniquitous pattern of anger. Now, this is what I want to tell you. We blame God for stuff that it ain't God's fault. Remember that scripture that says, oh, you prophesied in my name. You casted out demons in my name. You did this, 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 this. Your leaders in my name. Get away from me, you doers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Jesus said that to his ministers. Why? Doers of iniquity means doers of generational curses, doers of ancestral sin. You, if you know you got anger inside of you, jealousy, hatred, unforgettable, blah, 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 and you don't do nothing about it, but yet you want to blame God? No, 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 no. We have the blood of Jesus that you can ask, purge me from this hatred. Purge me from wanting to slap my employees. Purge me from... Right? But if you do nothing about it, that's what they did. You guys follow me? In other words, Moses was meeting with God on the regular in a tent. At any time, he probably could have said, I got an anger issue. I like to hit people and hit things with a staff. Guys, you guys follow me? That forfeited him. Okay, now watch this, guys. All right. One, this delay is a tactic that the enemy uses, but he can't use it without you. In other words, you have to partner with the devil, <laughs> like Moses, the best, the anger got the best of him, and he did something that cost him not going into the promised land. As a matter of fact, God said, well, none of you are gonna go in. That generation could not go in. And there we go again. A spirit of delay hit them for how many years? Who said that? Make sure he gets a bit smart. He's reading his Bible. <laughs> Another 40 years they had to circle until that generation died off. So first 400 to 430 years. Do you know that when they came out of Passover to go to Pentecost where Mount Sinai was? <laughs> you, you, do you guys know? that that was only supposed to be 11 days? What if God tells you in 11 days, your whole life is going to change for the better? All you got to do is believe it, repeat it, thank me for it. No, you want to turn around and go this way and go do something else and go hook up with something else. But God said 11 days, but you didn't believe it. And you just forfeited what God wanted to do. I'm telling you guys, that date, when they were supposed to go into the promised land and they didn't, that was the ninth of Av. They're still suffering to this day. All these horrific things always happen on the ninth of Av because they haven't repented of it. All right, so here we go. This is a tactic that the enemy uses. The delay the promises of God in your life and the purposes. Now let's go. Disrupt the timing of God. He wants to disrupt the timing. Whose timing is it? That's my question. This is supernatural stuff, guys. It's the timing that God has preordained in your life. In other words, if you feel like you're being cheated on the timing and you think, this is when waiting too long. I've been praying too long. The key is to pray like we learned last week, like that widow. I kept, kept going to the judge, kept going to the judge, kept praying, kept praying. As you're praying, you're developing a testimony. You, you have not because you pray not. That's a revelation, by the way. We all... Remember, guys, we live in a culture. <laughs> I was making fun of my, uh, I was making fun of uh, 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 some of the kiddos that I tutor, my own kiddos. We live in a generation, guys, where, hey, uh, this is working for me. Do it this way. I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate and then follow through. It works 100% of the time. Well, that seems too hard. And it looks like it took too long. How long did it take? 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. Well, I'm going to look on TikTok. I'm sure they got a better idea. I'm going to look on Google. I'm going to look on YouTube. I'm going to follow their pattern before I have to do the real work. 
You, you got, we live in a generation right now where they're actually, you, 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 they see it with their eyes, but they ain't going to believe it because it didn't come from the phone. Come on, guys. We're never going to ever substitute the presence of God in our lives and being discipled by doing life with somebody. You can't disciple. You cannot be discipled one day a week uh, in church. You have to, we have to do life with each other. We need each other. We need to be unified. We need to have accountability. You need to have some friends in you that are going to lead you to church, are going to lead you into the things of God. You know, you, know what, you know what baffles me? And I have had to ask myself that question. You guys ever have that friend? I still got a bunch of them. If you know you want to get into some dirt, I just got to just show up. It ain't going to cost me no money. It's going to be free. And it's on like Donkey Kong. Noel used to be that guy with me. You guys ever had that friend? Am I the only one? Huh? Whew. The friends that you know you're going to get into some problems with. That you, don't need to, you don't even have to second guess it. You just make a phone call. You guys down? Let's do it. Ah! Oh, you're off. You're missing for three days. We all have those friends. We went, we've been over backwards for that. And then we were talking about last week about being conformed and then transformed. Now we get saved and we don't want to do that no more. We don't want to be conformed. We don't want to be transformed. But we were being conformed and transformed into darkness, but now we don't want to be conformed and transformed into the light. Now that is what you have to ask yourself, why not? Why don't you want to be conformed? Why don't you want to be transformed? Why don't you want to invest Invest a little bit of time, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of reading the word to help change your mindset that keep dragging you back to the past. See, that's getting it real in the kingdom. That's getting real with yourself. It's, if you have a giant Goliath in your mind that keeps making you doing the same thing over and over and over, and you're not going to address it, you're just going to let him take over? You guys follow me on that? And that's why you need some accountability partners to say... Am I cray-cray? Every time I ask that, they go, you're out there, brother. You are out there. All right, now watch this. I want to close with this. If you feel you have been in a place of disrupted the timing of God in your life, that's why I love Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. We have the authority in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, here we go, here we go. It, only in Christ Jesus can we reset our timing? Only. You can try it any other way. I'm sorry, but it will not work. I have tried it. It doesn't work. Jesus can reset your timing. It, it, I like Passover because I always use that as like, Lord, I already know. I'm, I, I'm just going to come clean with you. I know I messed it up a bunch of times. And just in case that devil has messed me up on the timing of God in my life, I would like to make, oh Lord, here we go. I would like to make a fresh commitment with you. Yeah. I would like to come clean. You know what the Jewish mothers do on Passover a week before? They clean the house. Like, oh yeah. Porn, get rid of it. They just go around their house and they clean the house and get rid of anything that could have caused them to sin in that home. The Jewish mother does that for the whole family, by the way. When they open up in their Shabbat dinner, the Jewish mother is the one that prays over the household and blesses it. Because the Jewish people believe that it's because of Sarah that they're a Jewish nation. Remember, remember, remember she said, oh, 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 that guy ain't going to inherit. My son Isaac will inherit. And God was smart enough to, uh, Abraham was smart enough to listen. God said, listen to your wife. Uh, okay, so if you feel there's been a disruption of time, in, in, in you, you can go to the Lord and say, I need, I feel that maybe this has been taking too long. Maybe I haven't reached the goal that I wanted to reach upon the time that I wanted to reach it, Lord. And then you can ask the Lord, uh, don't, you can't entertain this without repentance, guys. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this without asking the Lord, was I the reason? Did I strike someone? By the way, you guys know how we strike people, right? You don't need a staff no more. This is our staff right here. This is our staff now. Out of the abundance of the heart speaks the text message. Oh, I ain't going to go there. 
Come on, man. I'm talking to myself. Oh. You ever love that when someone sends a text message? This message was deleted. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I wonder what they were saying. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Let me close with this, guys. So you can ask the Lord to reset your time and say, but before you do that, ask the Lord and repent. Lord, did I do something to cause a delay or a disruption in the timing of God or the promises that I am believing for? Did I, did I, was I, did I strike the Egyptian? Did I strike someone with my words? Did I speak a negative word against myself? Did, did I do something that, that, that is giving the devil permission to accuse me in the courts of heaven? Did someone in my bloodline do something? Because the reason why the timing of God is important, number one, it's his timing. His timing for your life. Because he knows the beginning and the end and the end from the beginning. And he created time to favor you. Oh, Lord, here we go. He created time. He created time to favor you and everything that you do. Okay? Now watch this. You can ask him to reset your time but you can't do it without repentance because the idea, see, to me, here we go, here we go. I'm closing with this. His goal is to disqualify you altogether. Now, this is going to be hard for some religious people to understand, and, and, and we battle this all the time. And I, 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 I speak sometimes prophetically to some people, and I'm only saying some stuff that God has told me that when I started on my journey with him, and I was so low, so down, so 12 feet under. I wasn't 6 feet. I was 12 feet. I was just down. And every time I said, it can't get any worse than this. I didn't know I was prophesying over myself. Sure enough, it got worse. And then something said, you better quit saying that. Because every time you say it, it gets worse, doesn't it? And I go... I'm over here, I'm in rebellion, conversating with God, and he's telling me, quit saying that, because every time it does, I'm going to do it for you, because you said it. And sure enough, every time I said that, everything was that. And then one day I go, I'm not going to say that no more, because every time you say that, it gets worse and worse and worse. And so when I, when I started engaging him, and he started speaking to me after a deliverance, and he never stopped since, and he says, I I'm going to do some things in your life, and I just need one thing from you. I'm not even going to ask you to jump through hoops. You don't need to do none of that. You don't need to, you don't need to wear anything specific. You don't need to, just maybe a cowboy hat. <laughs> I only ask one thing and one thing only from you. And I have every letter he's ever given me, guys. And he says, I just want you to believe me. Yeah. Believe me what I'm telling you. And he goes, I don't care what people say about you. I don't care what they say. He said, she says, and he says, the only thing I really care about is how you are perceiving the words that I'm speaking to you right now. And do you think that the gospel could be so easy that all you have to do is believe God at his word? I think it is because, and now we're not talking the kind of belief that we're used to out there, guys. You ever tell your kid to do something? Believe me, if you don't do this, I'm going to spank you. Sure enough, they go do it and you got to spank them. Okay, beat them. I'm talking about the type of belief that affects your body. The type of belief that no matter what you see with your eyes in the natural, you're going to believe that the word of God's being spoken over you in the word is, is what God is telling you. The type of belief that, that when Jesus told the people, he goes, if you love me, you will feed my sheep. In other words, God's love means you will do what I ask you to do. God's love means... You receive the love and it shows because you're acting on it. The type of belief that it makes you change. You guys follow me on that? Yeah, yeah. Not the type of belief where you say, I believe, but nothing in your life represents that belief system. Because out of the, uh, as a man thinketh, so is he. Whenever you see cray cray out there, 
or the opposite of cray cray, all you're looking at is people's belief systems in action. I'm talking about the kind of belief that when you believe that nothing can talk you out of that belief system. Yeah. And so that is a place that I think you can only obtain that you have to spend time with the Lord in the presence of God. And, 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 on, and I've said this before, you guys. Pay attention here because for some of us that minister, anointing, giftings, presence, okay? You can be anointed and gifted and operate on all kinds of levels. And in the end, God, Jesus never knew you. You know why? Because you weren't in the presence of God. That only comes through relationship. See, when God gives you and anoints you, he ain't going to take it back. Even if you're a cray-cray person and you bail out on God and you still want to do that kind of stuff, but you're out there and you really don't have a heart for the Lord, you can still operate in the anointings and the giftings, but you have no relationship with Jesus Christ. You know why? Because God doesn't take that away from you. But the presence of God is something separate. The presence of God is being in the presence of God where you hanging out with what Joshua was smart. He knew I need to stand by the tent where Moses is because he's talking face to face. The truth is 100, 200, 300, 5,000 people should have been at that tent waiting for Moses to come out. But it was only one person. It was Moses. It was Joshua and probably Caleb getting some leftovers off of what Moses was doing, talking face to face, face, to face with God. Go ahead. The presence of God is, is, is different than the anointings and the giftings, but being in the presence of God is, is relational. It's like you're really tight with him. The presence of God is what breaks. Oh, Lord, here we go. The presence of God is what makes things break. It breaks things. The presence of God, the devil can't operate in the presence of God because the presence is there and the devil can't. It's like a force field. He's just coming out, coming out, but he cannot operate inside that realm. You guys follow me on that? And so the reason why I say that, we can be disqualified altogether, but the Lord allows us Christians, men and women of God, that we can ask him to reset the time if you feel like these areas have been uh, delayed or disrupted or you feel that you've been disqualified, it's repentance first. Then we go in and ask the Lord, reset my timetable, Lord. Reset my timetable and help me learn from my mistakes. Okay, you guys follow me on that? Because Jesus is a time traveler. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was with you when you were involved in the bad stuff. He's with you in your present, and he's with you till all eternity in the future. So you can say, Lord, that event jacked me up from the floor up. That trauma, that, that illness, that divorce, that, that. Go back in time. Forgive me for the decisions I made for that time, Lord, and help me move forward from where I am today. And then you, you close that chapter, and then you look towards the future and say, take me to my future, Lord. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Come on, guys. Yeah. I want you guys to think about this coming up on Passover. I want you guys to really think, but I want you to meet with the Lord and say, Lord, delay, disrupt, help me. If you feel that you're being robbed. See, God loves conversations like that. You know why? Because he's always right. And number two, you'll probably learn something. Well, yeah, I did speak kind of negatively about my own situation. You know when you're going through a tight place, a, a rock and a hard place, and you open your mouth and say something negative? You know what God says? So be it. Out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. You said it, not me. That's why you got to be very, very, very careful when you're being challenged in your life on anything. you got to speak life and not death. Because sometimes you have to spend some time before the Lord. And I know I, every Passover, every time we do communion, the first thing, I, and I got a big mouth. You guys know that from the get. The first thing that I say, Lord, forgive me, because I'm sure I said some crazy stuff. And sometimes I say it about myself. Sometimes I say it about uh, situations. Forgive me for everything that I said out of my mouth that didn't line up with your word. Just, just, let's just go there, Lord. And then I ask him to reset my mouth. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time of fellowship, Lord. Father, I just thank you, and I ask you in Jesus' name, Father. Father, 
you, where it says that you do nothing, nothing, nothing without revealing it to your prophets first, Lord. Father, I just ask you in Jesus' name that as we approach this Passover season, that you help us, Father. Father, we come against any spirit of delay, any disruption of God's timing in our personal businesses, our lives, Lord. I I anything that the enemy has used against us, Father, I'm asking for the blood of Jesus, Lord, to cover those sins, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, help us reset our timetable, the timing of the Lord. Help us be involved in the timing of the Lord, Father. Help us not turn from the right to the left. Help us keep our eyes on the mark, and you are our mark, Lord. Lord. You're our king. You're, our, you're the lover of our soul, Lord. And we ask you in Jesus' name to help us reset our timetables, Lord, as we approach this Passover season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.